You have your Bibles turned to the book of Acts, chapter 1. Also, John 14, and hopefully 1 Corinthians 13. Pastor John, how are you doing this morning? Acts chapter 1, we'll start there. <clears throat> Before we break into the Word of God, I'd like to just uh, keep a young man, Cami, in prayer this morning. I got a text message from my buddy, uh, Rob Melvistudo. We know the Melvistudos. Um, very well. Uh, their son's uh, uh, girlfriend has uh, a young man, 18 years old, a son 18, who was in a motorcycle accident. Um, he was laying in a ditch for 12 hours before he came to. Um, thank God uh, he's in ICU right now. Um, he's not quite himself. He's, got a, he's going to need surgery on the leg and has a brain bleed. Um, 18 years old, you know, they're all bulletproof at 18 and younger, you know, um, on, a, on a crotch rocket and, um, and it just lost control. And so let's pray for a cabin right now. Father, we just lift this young man before your throne of grace. And God, and we pray that you would show yourself real to him. God, we need a move of your spirit. We don't do anything in our own power. We don't do anything in our own authority. We don't ask for anything without your will being included, Father. And so, Father, we come to you because you commanded us to, to ask. And so, Father, we come and we ask for this young man, not just for, for his healing, but also, Father, for his eternal salvation. We pray through this that, Father, you would move and manifest your power in a mighty way. And so, Father, touch him spiritually, touch him physically. May through, somehow through this, Lord, that you can ignite this family uh, for yourself. So touch him, I pray. Now, Lord, as we go into your word and dive into your word, I just pray that, Father, that you would just have your way, have your way in our midst. For, Lord, we know that, Father, it is not easy, Lord, to live in this life, to live in this world. But, Father, you have made us overcomers by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We quoted this last week as it was Pentecost Sunday. And I am teaching on the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Trinity. I want the kids to leave. Young people, head out to your Sunday school class. I thought I already said that. Forgive me. If you don't want to go to Sunday school and you want to stay with me, I understand. You're too big to go to Sunday school. Where are you going? I have the key for you today. I have the key to get you out of your situation. Jesus, again, dealing with his disciples at this time as they continue to question him foolishly, as many of us do, wanting to know when he's going to restore his kingdom. And he's like, hey, guys, you're not just, you're not getting it. And, and can I be honest with you? Most people in the church don't get it. Can I be honest? And if you're going to be honest with yourself, I had to have that revelation. I had to be honest with myself. You know, most people come to church and they just don't get it. They don't understand why they're here. They don't understand the purpose for their lives on this earth because the world makes it all about you when it's nothing about us, but it's all about him. And then people fall into this self-absorbed self state of 
mind and they can't seem to get out of this cycle. But I have the key for you today. And Jesus said it to his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Let's read it together. But you will receive power. Let's just stop there. Can you imagine God himself saying to you that you will receive power? And I I don't want there to be a misconception here. Because people think because you speak in tongues that you have some kind of form of power. That's a sign. Let's just be clear. It was a sign for the early church as they were in that upper room for 10 days, 120 of them spoke in all different languages because at this time there was a holiday of Pentecost that was being celebrated. There were probably swelling over a million people from all different regions, all different languages, all different types, but they were all Jews, coming together to celebrate, and each one of them heard their own language being spoken by people that shouldn't speak their language. The sign. But the power came when the Holy Spirit came upon them with tongues of fire, and Peter opened up his mouth not to proclaim or profess anything of his own, but to give the gospel of Jesus Christ out, and 3,000 lives were transformed in a moment. That's power. That's power. Everybody thinks it's power when you can sit there and speak in tongues. Paul says, listen, I can speak in tongues more than all of you. I can speak in this tongue, that tongue. I can speak in tongues of angels. But if I don't have love, and we're going to get into that in a minute, I got nothing. I got nothing. And do you know how many people I hear speak in tongues and they do not have love? They're critical. They're grumpy. And they're forever telling you this is the way you should be. This is the way you should act. This is the what kind of clothes that you need to wear. This, that, and the other thing. Forget that. That's not power. Don't think because you can speak in tongues that you carry some kind of authority from on high. It is meaningless if you don't have love. You know, when we think of Memorial Day... We think of all of these young men and women who gave up their life in service to their country. That's what Memorial Day is. And it goes back all the way to, I believe, 1868 during the Civil War. When a guy says, we need to honor these people. Decoration Day, I think it was called, or Declaration Day. Can I tell you something? I really appreciate these people who have given their life for our freedom, but not one of them wanted to die. And the thing that breaks my heart the most is because the thing that matters the most, I don't know whether or not they're in eternity knowing Christ as Lord and Savior. No greater love than this, John 15 says, than to lay one's life down for one's friend. See, that is true power. No. We're not talking about the physical laying down of one's life. We're talking about the spiritual. When somebody insults you and you don't retaliate, that's laying your love down. When somebody does you wrong and you don't turn your back on them, but you continue to care for them, that's laying one's life down for someone else. It's getting slapped and getting slapped again and getting slapped again and getting slapped again and not turning your back on that individual. That's laying your life down. You don't give up on people. Memorial Day is to think of all of these young men and women. And then let's also think of all of those who, who gave up their lives by friendly fire. People that weren't in the military. 
innocent bystanders. So to be a true man and woman of God, we have to adhere to Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. See, that's power. I can't offer anything in the flesh, but I can offer everything in the spirit. You can offer everything in the spirit. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. So let's go back to Acts 1. He says, Jesus says, Jesus says, Jesus says, I I, I want you to go because I need to go. Because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit doesn't come. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't come, you got no power. You got nothing. And most people are in the state that they're in. Now, there's a difference between the Lord allowing you to go go through something so you will grow out of it. And then there's those people that are in the state that they're in because of their own doing. And they're in that state because they're not being led properly by the true power of God, which is the Holy Spirit. So when we think of the third person of the Holy Spirit, where Jesus says, this is the power that I am going to give to you, the question is, how do you view that power? How do you think that power is to be used? As far as I'm concerned, it's to be used as Jesus directed his followers. Turn to John 14. Verse 15, I started it last week. We'll pick up there. You all love me today? I wouldn't be up here if I didn't love you. Where's my Michael? There you are, brother. Can't wait to hear about your trip. So here we have Jesus with his disciples. He's got to comfort them because they still, after three and a half years walking with him, they didn't truly understand his plan. And most people on the earth truly don't understand the plans that God has for you. Jeremiah 29. It's plans to prosper you, maybe not the way you think. Name it and claim it. He has plans and purpose to accomplish the Great Commission in and through your life. We've we've come to understand this. Amen? Amen. You've heard me preach it. You've heard me teach it. This This is our purpose, is to bring the gospel to the lost, to the dying, to the wretched, to the poor. Try to break through the ceiling of the rich. Because people who are rich, they have no need for God. And I hate to tell you guys, we in America live as in the 93 percentile throughout the world as the richest people. And how many people truly in America have a need for God? Even when you're poor, you got welfare. Come on, let's be honest. You get your food, you get your housing, you get your cell phone, you get your card. Everything that you want, medical, you're not in need for God. You may know about God because somebody shared the gospel when you were in, when you were in the trenches. 
And so his disciples are sitting here, not understanding that, he, all right, he's going to die. Where are you going? He's telling them where we go. Thomas is doubting. You know, he's like, Lord, what do you, he says, come on, guys. How often do I have to teach you the same lesson and you still don't understand? And he recognized and realized what the church needed is the true unadulterated power that comes from the Holy Spirit. That's how you become an overcomer of every temptation, from every weakness, from every attack. It's through the Holy Spirit. You don't do it in your own strength. You need deliverance. You need to be set free. You need chains broken. You need to have a different mindset. What you need is the Holy Spirit. Can we agree on that? Because Jesus said to him, listen to what he says to him. After they're going through and they're all knuckleheads, John 14 and down to verse 15, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So he starts with that. When we do that, verse 16 kicks into gear. He says, and I will ask my father, and he will give you an advocate. Everybody loves an advocate, right? Yeah. Somebody who stands in the gap on your behalf. You heard, you heard, um, you heard um, Jeff uh, briefly describe what, what Javi and his family went through. Okay, they had to go to court. My wife went with them as the interpreter. That was a joke. She doesn't speak Spanish. But anyway, she's learning. But, but to be honest with you, it was their daughter, Lady. Lord, Lady, stand up. Come on, don't give me no grumpy thing. This is Lady. Everybody say hello to Lady. Hello, Lady. Now sit down. Sit down. Too bad on you. I'm the pastor. I get to have this power. So Lady is uh, 20 years old, and, and she got a letter in the mail. We're sending you home. Gave her a court date, this and that. Obviously, it turns the stomach of the family, turns her stomach, this, that, and the other thing. And so what do, you, what do, you, what do we do? We're not looking out there with hatchets ready to fight, you know. She, they're doing their proper due diligence. They're filing their papers. They're doing everything according to the law. And she gets this letter in the mail, and it says, guess what? And it was from ICE. You're going home, going back to your country. I don't, I'm not even going to share her story or their story. That'll be for them to testify one day why they can't go back to their country. And of course, I mean, we don't have anything on the docket for you. But it's all in black and white in the paperwork, right? And, and even if we did, you know what? The judge isn't here anyway. So go. Go home. You know what they did? They left and went out to lunch. And then, and then he says, you know, come back and see us, what, next year. Now, I want you to understand something. That is only orchestrated by the power of the Holy Spirit manifesting. Amen. Nobody else did anything. And, and here's what I need you to get a hold of today is what you need is that same power living in you, operating through you. Not with your wants, not with your desires, but with the power of the Holy Spirit working in you. Let's pay up here. We're up here. Um, there you go. So Jesus starts off, he says, listen, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. There's a reason he starts with that, because he says, and if you do that, he kicks into gear and says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another, what, advocate to help you and be with you, and I love this part, forever. The spirit of what? Truth. Okay, now. Do you know what truth is? It's being honest with yourself.
the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be with you. Jesus' words, not mine. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you before long. The world will not see me anymore. But what? You will see me. Because I live, you also, what? Will live. And on the day you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Can I tell you something? That is an unbelievable eye-opening experience. God's Holy Spirit lives here in me. His unadulterated spirit. And you know what he's doing? He's forever, forever correcting me. I'm telling you, it's like having another wife. She's not, she's not in the room right now. I want you to understand this. That spirit that's living inside me is the one that drives me to everything outside of this world. Do you understand, Teresa? It doesn't drive me to the desires of this world. It actually drives me away from the desires of this world. It doesn't drive me to sin. It drives me away from sin. It literally sets off the alarm when sin is around me, when sin is present. It literally is going wild inside me. He says, hey! That's how the Holy Spirit speaks to me. He might be a small, still, gentle voice for you, but I'm thick. And he needs to penetrate this mind. So he's like, hey! There you go. Joya, I think he's Italian. <laughs> Italians are loud. They're unforgiving. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I don't mean unforgiving. The, not the Holy Spirit is unforgiving, but relentless. But then again, whole, <laughs> the worldly Italians are unforgiving, that's for sure. Uh, but anyway, we're going to move on from that before I get Debbie kicking me or throwing shoes at me. No, no shoes. So listen, he goes on. Listen to this. Be long, before long, back to 19, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day, you will realize I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I in you. What day is he talking about? The day that the power of God's Spirit lives in you. On that day, your eyes will be open. On that day, you will have an understanding. On that day, your spiritual eyes, the scales will fall off. Your spiritual ears will become unclogged on that day. And we know that day happened for the, for the 120 in the upper room because when, when Peter came out and they were calling him all drunkards, he says, no. We're not drunk. It's too early in the morning. He says, what you have seen is the power of God in men, in women. And then he went on to proclaim that power to these people. And guess what happened next? They were cut to the heart. And the power of God cut them so deep, they actually cried out and says, what are we to do? And what do you think he said to them? Repent. 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 Now, remember what I said. In that moment, 3,000 men, they didn't count ladies and kids back in the day. I'm sorry, ladies. I'm counting you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Solid. Eight, nine. There's a lot of ladies in this church. 3,000 were transformed. Jesus says, I have to leave so I can send him. Now, nothing for nothing, in that very sermon, more people's lives were transformed than all of the years that Jesus preached. 
He fed 15,000, right? They were all hungry. But did their lives get transformed? No, they wanted more food. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. Guys, look at this and hear this. It was the power of the Holy Spirit that transformed their lives, that changed them, changed your thinking, changed your attitude, changed your, changed your presentation, changed your desires. That's what took place on the day of Pentecost. They were all transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit to understand their true purpose. And at that moment... You didn't hear Peter get into a boat again, do you? <laughs> Except to be tra transported from one island or to the next. He never went out fishing again. Do you understand the transformation when the power of the Holy Spirit comes on you? He understood life. He understood purpose. And you know what the problem is? A lot with our younger people, they don't know that. What college should I go to? You know what you hear your parents say? Pray about it. Okay, let's talk about that for a moment. Pray about what college you go to or pray about purpose. Pray about direction. To fulfill the great commission that is in everyone's life. Can you understand what greatness God wants to do in you and through you. People measure greatness by, by how many people they have at a Bible study. People measure greatness by how big their church is or how many people they influence. I'm going to tell you what greatness is. Influence one life. See, one life changed for Christ. And then you will understand the power of the Holy Spirit. What does God say? I leave the 99 to go after the one. That's right. And I want to say this too, that he left so much and he has chased you. In every dark place that you have been, the Holy Spirit was calling. In every sin that we committed, the Holy Spirit was telling us not to. And then when we were a sloppy mess, the Holy Spirit was there saying, let me cleanse you. Let me wash you. Let me transform you into the image that I have for you. And Jesus is letting these people know the message. He's saying power is going to come upon you. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. And then he goes on to the kicker again. Whoever has my what? Commands and keeps them is the one who what? Loves me. See it reversed? Loves and commands, commands and loves. The one who loves me will be loved by the, my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. So all of a sudden Judas not the betrayer, said to the Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replies, here we go again. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. And then with that, my Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching, these words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while I'm still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. Power of the Holy Spirit. An advocate, I want to say this. Remember, we, we get down to the original Hebrew and Greek, the translation. Can I grab your husband's hand? Come here, hubby. Okay? We always like to say that, well, the Holy Spirit's here. It's in me. Well, first of all, we know him to be an advocate, right? When you're in a courtroom, I don't know. I, I, how many of you? Don't raise your hand. So uh, if you've ever been in court, I have, right? 
I've been there. And if you go to court, you have an attorney with you. And what does your attorney do? He's an advocate. He stands at your side. He's right here. And that's how the Holy Spirit is. He's my advocate. He's right here. Every situation, the Holy Spirit's right by my side. Every confrontation, the Holy Spirit's right by my side. It's true. Every temptation, Holy Spirit's right here. Every time I pick up the Word of God, Holy Spirit's right next to me, giving me insight and instruction. Everybody says, well, I'm no great theologian. Open up the Word and let the great theologian, your advocate, speak to you. Ooh, good stuff right there. When you need power, listen to me, the advocate gives power. When you need somebody to hold the standard against him, the advocate steps in the way and says, I'll take the heat. This is the power of the Holy Spirit, which lives in every believer who what? Sit down, my friend. Says what? Keeps his commandment and does what? Obeys and what? Loves. And here's the problem. Most of us don't obey. Most of us don't love. Can I tell you something? The truth of the matter is most of us don't know how to love. And here, here's another problem, ladies. This is what I found out because this group's paying attention. The truth of the matter is most people are looking for love in all the wrong places. I have never experienced such love as I have from the forgiving power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I remember when I got saved, gave my heart to Jesus, and everybody's all excited for me. He says, do you love Jesus? I go, nope. <laughs> they looked at me like I was, there was a problem with me. I said, how can I love somebody I don't know? Right, Joey? How could you love anybody you don't know? I couldn't see the Holy Spirit, but I knew he was there. And most people are not seeking after God, not seeking to obey him or to love him. So Jesus says here in, 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 in both ways, first he says to love me, you, gotta keep, you love me and keep my commandments. Then he says you got to keep my commandment and the one who does loves me. He says in verse 23, he says, anyone who loves me will, what, obey my teaching? And he says, in all of this, guess what? Then you can have the Holy Spirit. So everybody who walks around and says, the Spirit of God is with me and is in me. If you don't love God and if you're a sinner, you are living a lie. I'm living a lie. If you want to have an unadulterated experience with God and the advocate to walk in you, walk through you, walk with you, then you must obey everything the Lord says that I've commanded you. That means, oh, there's no pet sins in the sight of God. What there is is seeking after the advocate to deliver you from these pet sins. These chains that have bound you up for decades. The way you think, the way you speak, the way you act must glorify God. And if it's not, we have to change our thinking. We have to change our spirit, speech. We have to change our attitude. And that only comes by seeking after God and obeying him. I want to talk about love for a few moments. As we see this, we see that God, Jesus himself, 
And I, I hope you can understand this. We see him saying, listen, I don't want you to live by any false doctrine. I'm making it very plain and very clear to you that you must love and obey me for my Holy Spirit to walk with you. Do not live in this delusion that you can't have that. And then he says, I want you to love me. Now, I want to be very clear that he's not looking for a friendship love. Remember, we're his bride, right? And he's the groom. We're married. How you doing? Right? We don't have a friendship love. That ain't happening here. We have an intimate love. We have an agape love. Agape, if you want to get the French accent. It's intimate. Do we... How are you? Every little breeze seems to whisper the wind. No, I'll get inside. God doesn't want a surface love. He don't want friendship. He wants agape. He wants the real thing. He wants the deep thing. He wants the thing that will cause you to lay your life down for him. Amen. I will die for her without a doubt. And you want to know something? I would die for each of you. I would. Oh, you're just saying that. No, 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 no. The spirit in me is saying that. There's an intimacy. There's a deep understanding of God in that agape love. Let me give you an explanation. This agape love, which is a Greek word for love, this love that is considered unconditional. This is the love that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 13, and it, it's the most appropriate for understanding what it means to love Jesus. Paul explains this type of love by what it does and what it does not do. So I love it. Baby, you know I love you, right? How do you know I love you? Did you hear? You show it to me all the time. Love is an action word. See, it's not an emotional feeling inside. <laughs> it's not just the fluttering in the heart. It's an action word, sister. That's what true love is. And can I understand? Can I explain something to you? Jesus loves you so much that he provided action for you. He died on the cross. No greater love than this than to hang himself from a tree. To be spit on, to be broken, to be pierced, to be mocked, all because he loved you. By his own creation. Can you imagine that? So we have an agape love. God wants that same kind of intimacy, that same kind of honesty, that kind of, that kind of desire. I desire Jesus. And can I tell you, I didn't always desire Jesus. I didn't always walk right. I went through the motions. I thought I was right. I said the prayer. I thought I was okay. I thought I was living right. And see, but, but, but understand, love is an action word. It's not just, you know, words are empty if they don't have anything behind them. Go to 1 Corinthians 13.
Now, Paul, he starts, and we're going to get into these over the months, spiritual gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. But in chapter 13, Paul, addressing the Corinthians in his first letter, he starts off in verse 1. He says, if I speak in what? Say that again. If I speak in what? Of men and of angels, but have not what? I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I want to stop there for a minute. See, back in that day, that church, the church of that day, in that region in Corinthians, they were just, everywhere you went to these false temples, this and that, they had gongs going and cymbals and all of this stuff. So he was addressing that. He says, if I speak in tongues and I have not love, I'm just like those other churches down the street. Those pagan churches. Those false religions. And and what proves love is, is the action behind it. 1 Corinthians. If I speak in tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong and a clinging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I have gained nothing. That's why to enter into heaven, he needs not just be your Savior, but he needs to be your Lord. Now here's where love lies. Jesus says, if you love me, he says, you're going to be patient. Verse 4. He says, if you love me, you're going to be kind. If you love me, you're not going to envy. If you love me, you're not going to boast. This is a good checklist. If you love me, you're not going to be proud. If you love me, you're not going to be rude. If you love me, you're not going to seek after yourself. If, you're, if you love me, you're, you're not going to be easily angered. If you love me, you're not going to keep a checklist of all the wrongs everybody's done. Verse 6, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. And verse 7, love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. Love never fails. It's amazing how often this is quoted at weddings. And to have more than half of them end up in divorce. Because they truly don't understand how to love. We truly have to understand if God's spirit is going to be living on us and to have that power in us and and to be able, to be honest with you, to wield that power, we must love God. And the way we love is through these actions. Now here's the hope. And I love this. I can live all of these things out. And you can live all of these things out by being intentional. What does that that look like? Lord, I need your help. Come here, Kenny. I think he's a great representation of the Holy Spirit. (laughs) 
Holy Spirit, I need your help. Okay. I have an anger problem. Okay. Don't laugh at me, Holy Spirit. It's serious now. <laughs> Holy Spirit, I'm not walking right. Okay. I need your help. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Holy Spirit, I need you to transform my heart. You're with me. I want more of you and less of me. I want to live out Galatians 2.20. 2 I, I want, I'm no longer in the world, but I'm in Christ Jesus. I need to manifest your power in me. Help me. And guess what the Holy Spirit says? He says, of course I'm going to help you. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to transform you. I'm here to restore. I'm here to deliver. I'm here to set free. Continue to seek me, and we're going to work this out together. And before you know it, guess what? You're not going to have those th thoughts any longer. Before you know it, you're not going to have that desire. Before you know it, that body is not going to be aching for drugs, alcohol, promiscuity. Before you know it, your thinking changes. Before you know it, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Before you know it, you're rebuking the devil. Before you know it, you're telling where the devil will go. Before you know it, the devil won't even be around you. Before you know it, the devil won't even be in your house. Before you know it, you're going to walk and every place you step is going to be holy. By the power of the Holy Spirit. But you have to be intentional by seeking him out day in and day out to be delivered, to be set free, and most of all, to be transformed. Thank you, Holy Spirit. My pleasure. Oh, Let's all stand together. Today you need to draw a line in the sand. Because just as I study and I read and I'm asking the Holy Spirit to open my eyes, I'm sure some of you today, your eyes have been open. I didn't even get into the commandment part. We're still in love. Yes. I want to leave you with this and then I'm going to pray you out. The only way to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to empty yourself out. Because there's no room for the both of you. There's no room for salt water and fresh water to mingle together. Because when you put those two together, you get a lousy, lukewarm mouthwash. So to be honest with yourself and say, Holy Spirit, I want to die to self and live in Christ. Help me. See, remember the saying says, the scripture says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus, who is the one who gives me the strength. I'm not doing it in my own strength. You're not doing it in your own strength. You're doing it as his power. If you want to have a fulfilled life, if you want the emptiness to go away, if you want those ungodly desires to leave, you must invite him in. And be honest and ask to be changed. So, Father, we come to you today. A special day, a day that we come to worship you, to lift your name on high. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and manifest your power in us. And Father, we need to be like those in the upper room. They did nothing but tarry and wait upon you. They didn't occupy their time. They stayed put and waited on you. Some of us today need to make that decision to just stay put. When we go home, we don't put the TV on. We don't look at the cell phone or the computer. We just sit there with the word of God and stay put until you come. That means we mean business with you. 
So, Father, we are desiring to be filled with the genuine Holy Spirit, not with the counterfeit that the devil loves to mock. So, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just empower us and show yourself real today. Bless your people. I know, God, you're not like man that you would lie, but you promise to transform each of our lives. You're not going to do for one and not for the other. If we're all genuine in our heart and our thinking, you will do for each one of us. So Holy Spirit, come. Come now. As we empty ourselves out of ourselves, Lord, you come and fill us to overflowing. We ask this in Christ's name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful weekend. Oh, hey guys, before we leave, I got to pray for the offering. Guys, don't go anywhere. Look at me. Hold it. We're going to pray for the offering. It's a sign of worship and I can't forget it. Father, we just thank you for the offering that has been given today. Lord, bless each person that can give and each person that couldn't give at this time, Father. And I just pray that we would be good stewards of that which is entrusted to the church. Bless these people for their wonderful generosity, Lord. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.